Welcome to the Citizens Report for the 12th of February 2021. I'm Elisa Barwick. Joining me today is Citizens Party leader Craig Isherwood. Welcome, Craig. Yeah, thanks, Elisa. And on today's show, we're going to discuss the, la the Liberal Labor plot to sabotage postal banking and China regime change fantasy means world war. So straight into our first topic today, Liberal Labor plot to sabotage postal banking. Now, there's possibly never been a more important time that this country, facing the economic crisis and cliff edge that we are now on, needs to have a sovereign capability to fund the redevelopment and rebuilding of this nation. And yet the tiniest step in that direction, uh, even the threat of a step towards a postal bank, and which we've suggested could be then utilised to unleash a flow of deposits that could be channelled into a national infrastructure bank to fund the development of the country. The tiniest step in that direction um, was smashed by a coordinated effort, the exact goings on of which we don't know, but a coordinated Labor Liberal effort um, which saw Christine Holgate uh, removed from Australia Post. And our campaign to rectify that situation, that which we call the three R's, uh, release the report, that was the Maddox report, has been released, we've achieved that. Replace the board, there's moves in that direction I'll go through. Uh, and reinstate Christine Holgate, which now we have to really ramp up the pressure on, um, is the subject of today's discussion. Now on that second point, replacing the board, an article came out from Terry McCran in The Australian on the 8th of February, which is very significant, where he stated that it is impossible to avoid the conclusion that the five current directors who were on the board when the watches were given in November 2018 must now resign. And he points out that the board is ultimately responsible for any um, goings on relating to proper use of public resources. Uh, but he goes on to add that the current chairman should also be ditched for spinelessly throwing his CEO under the bus under a t utterly inappropriate and utterly hysterical political pressure from the Prime Minister. Um, now, this week, Robert Barwick interviewed on our Citizens Insight show the director of the licensed post office group, Angela Cramp. And what she revealed is that the October 22 ambush of Christine Holgate uh, occurred in the very same month when Christine Holgate was scheduled to uh, begin negotiations to renew the deal that she struck or that her four executives who were given watches as a reward for that deal which is known as Bank at Post, where the banks were forced to pony up a certain amount of money every year so that the Australian post offices, licensed post offices, could get some income for providing all those services which the banks are no longer providing because they're shutting down all their branches. Now, as yet, as Angela reveals, that deal, which was is due to expire, it was a deal for three to five years, has to be renegotiated, but it has not yet uh, the re renegotiations have not yet commenced, which leaves those post office branches in jeopardy as to whether they will continue to get that funding. Uh, and what I want to do is run a clip from that interview where what you'll see is the emphaticness from the licensed post office group um, that everything that uh, occurred that under Christine Holgate's um, tenure at Australia Post was absolutely valued. It was precious to these guys. They want her back. And she also uh, defends the granting of the gold watches. So we'll just run that clip. Christine Holgate had gone around the world visiting, before she took over as CEO, visiting post offices around the world. And she, from that experience, she had seen that a key way to secure postal services in this modern technology era, where there's less mail, is through combining postal services with financial services. She saw it in Switzerland, she saw it in India, she saw it in France, and she came back thinking this could work here. She consulted your LPO group, then she, then she led an executive team in going to the banks and saying to them, you've had a good wicket all this time, we, you now have to, and, and this has come out of the, the licensed post office's pockets, you now have to pay. Now. Angela, I think it's very significant that one of the big four said, well, we're not going to pay 
for what we've been getting for free, right? Um, that shows you this was this was not a, a lay down mazette. This was a, 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 a an intense negotiation. The big banks and all and the smaller financial institutions between them put up two hundred and twenty million dollars, and then and so that was very successful. It made a huge difference, but. Um, uh, that wasn't enough for Christine because then she made sure that a big chunk of that or a significant, a big enough chunk of that went back to you, you guys, right? Instead of just pocketing that as, oh, this is, look at this is the good for the bottom line, I get a bigger bonus, right? No, she made sure it went back to the licensed post offices. So this is extraordinary. So what I've described there is, is the deal called bank at post, right? And so that's the description. Do you think that the executives who she rewarded a $5,000 roughly Cardia watch each for that deal, deserve that reward. Absolutely. Absolutely. Every licensee thinks they were entitled to a lot more. If they were happy to get a $5,000 watch, Cartier or any brand, yeah. fabulous. Like it, And really, it's a testament to her leadership like those people could have expected $150,000 yeah. apparently. I mean, I'm not up to speed with executive bonuses, but for the level of revenue that they brought in, the expectation that they would have got a much higher bonus is quite real apparently. Yeah. But if Christine Holgate, you know, she gave them a watch because she wanted to mark this moment in time that these people went out of their way. It wasn't their job to do this. This was not part of their contract or their KPIs. Nobody said this could be done. Everybody said the banks will not agree to this. Give it up. Forget it. And Christine Holgate and this team actually the, were determined to make it happen because yep. she had committed to it. And, like, look, she did it. You know, it, it is pretty much why we are so passionate about hanging on to her for grim death because we do believe it is grim death without her, without the quality that she brings to this position. Like, yes, she can find another CEO apparently, but... $350,000, you can find an imitation. We do not want an imitation. Yeah. We want exactly what she can do. And if they can't find a clone of Christine Holgate, we just don't understand why we don't have the real thing who is still under contract to Australia Post. So, Elisa, I think it's really important that people watch the entire video to get the sense of all the lies that have been propagated through the media and so forth. One thing is really stunning to me is that this uh, bank at post initiative was done not within the job description of the executives that did it. This was something outside. They used their holiday time. They used their uh, you know, weekends. They did everything to get this job done. And that's why they got rewarded by $4,000 worth of watches. And, you know, you look at the entire video, you'll see just how the licensed post office owners, which was 3,000, uh, you know, families that have put up to a million dollars each into their operations have been totally screwed by not just this government, con but consecutive governments. And as we've said, the intention here is to sell Australia Post off and to stop it being a competi competitor to the major private banks. And this is where the government has to step in, which is they're not going to do unless we provide the necessary pressure. So what we're calling people to do that are watching this video is call up the two ministers that are responsible, that are on the board of Australia Post. And that's the uh, Finance Minister Simon Birmingham and the Communications Minister Paul Fletcher. And the most important thing to do, call them up and say, reinstate Christine Holgate. And if they say, oh no, but she's already resigned, that's not true. The fact is that she decided, she, was, she said that she would step aside, I think, for a couple of weeks but that was taken as a resignation. It's not true. So the point is, tell them to reinstate Christine Holgate, and the more people that we get to do that, mm. 
the more uh, pressure is put forward. Yeah, we've them. had, I mean, even one of our supporters in an airport the other day fronted up Senator Birmingham and demanded she reinstate Christine Holgate, which she was forced to say after a short discussion, I'll consider it. So the more they get pressure on this, the better they are getting inundated with calls. Also, you can forward the Angela Cramp interview, the YouTube link or so forth, or go to our website for the press release to your local Federal Member of Parliament. That would also be very useful. Now, we're going to keep talking about the implications of a postbank right after this break. Welcome back to the Citizens Report, where we're discussing the Liberal Labor plot to sabotage postal banking in this country. And in previous shows, we've talked about how postal banking is something that's taken off around the world in recent years and decades, actually, um, as a means of getting people's deposits somewhere safe, first and foremost, but then secondly, um, harnessing that to put into development of the nation. And as we point out in Australia, this week's Australian Alert Service, and you can call us for a complimentary copy if you haven't already to find out more, Australia Post was said to have been in talks about becoming a bank in its own right in recent years under the tenure of Christine Holgate because she had travelled the world and seen the success stories of postal services um, but part of the success of it was the retail function and also the fact that they operated to take deposits um, and operated as a banking service in some form or another. Um, now we want to show another clip from uh, an upcoming show in our Citizens Insights series and this is a a stunning interview with a very high level figure from Japan by the name of Daisuke Kotogawa and he's the former defense uh, deputy he's the former deputy director of the Ministry of Finance he's the former Japanese representative to the International Monetary Fund and now research director at Japan's Canon Institute um, so he's had a lot to do with these roles in banking in Japan over the years what he discusses prior to this clip that I'm going to show is how the government has borrowed money from Japan Post Bank, which is a, you know, a, a monumental postal bank and world renowned. So it borrowed money from Japan Post and from pension funds in order to invest into the economy, into things like industry and road and rail building and so forth. And in this clip that we'll run, he talks about the difference between simply making a financial return on the one hand, which people do to make a profit, but even more importantly, on the other hand, he talks about the economic return for the nation as a whole, which is really critical, um, but a lot of people won't do it because there's not an immediate profit into it. So those things need to be funded, which includes a lot of infrastructure development. Um, and then he goes on to talk about how Japan's debt is it's big, but it's owed internally to people within the country. So they haven't had to draw a lot of foreign borrowings to develop their nation. So we'll run that clip. And would it be true to say that these, this, this form of lending through the fiscal investment and loan program funded by Postbank, et cetera, this would be lending to the areas that the private banks would not be prepared to lend to? Basically, I think, um the, the very simple uh, answer to that is, you may have learned in your university the difference between economic return and financial return. Financial return means if a company runs a business, the, that company has to have financial return, which will justify its business by way of uh, the profits, right? Um, but as a society, you have to also know the notion of the economic uh, return. That is, for example, if you improve the, the, the road, which is basically public, of course, you cannot make money out of constructing, I think, a, a road. Yeah. But if the, uh, the, the time of travel for anybody who would like to go through that kind of roads would be shortened, then society as a whole, it will have a big gain as the as saved, uh, saved time. And so, so this economic return, uh, any, kind of, any kind of project that has an economic return have to be considered by, by the government. 
Well, uh, although they are not fungible uh, by the by the by the private and uh, commercial banks. Yes. So the yeah the commercial banks can't can't get a financial return, but there is an economic return, and it's up to the government to make that decision. And what you're describing there is. Um, the, the, the general model we would like people to think about when we advocate a postal bank and a national economic development bank or an infrastructure bank, because it's for the same reason. The private sector invests in what it can get a, pri a financial return out of. We need institutions that can invest in what the country can make an economic return out of. So that's, that's um, uh, a, a very good point to make. Now, Japan, uh, Daisuke, is, is, is number one in the world in public debt, <laughs> it has an enormous public debt, 230 percent of GDP, but it's not as bad a problem as people might think it is because of the postal bank, right? Uh, no, uh, the, I think the main reason why we don't have to worry about our debt is 93 percent of our debt has been financed internally. I, I, uh, I think domestically, so yeah. there is no concern about being attacked by the so-called the, the so -called, I think, foreign speculators in the case of Japan. That is not the case for the United States or other I think, European countries. Uh, they cannot actually uh, finance their own debts, I think, internally. So they, they always suffer from a, a potential attack by those foreign, I think, speculators. Yeah. Yes. So the, 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 the funds that the government has borrowed from institutions like Japan Post Bank has been able to fund Japan's economic development without relying on foreign investors. Yes, well, Alyssa, I think that Daisuke makes a very good point here about the nature of the debt in Japan. Because look, if it's 93% of it is owed internally, they're not beholden to foreign, uh, foreign uh, lenders. It's completely different to what it is in Australia. See, the role of debt doesn't have to be feared if it is lent into uh, areas of productive economy, if you're expanding your economy, providing the necessary goods and services, and not simply borrowing the money to speculate, you have a fundamentally different economy than you do if you're borrowing money to spend it on the stock market or other speculative activities. And this is the big difference. But in this particular case, the idea of borrowing it locally, that's something I know all Australians would love to think, that, we, that they'll be able to invest their money somewhere it can be put into the development of our country Right, and that's where the Australia Post Bank comes in. That's where our national bank idea comes in. We could raise enormous amounts of credit, oh, sorry, money or deposits to issue in credit, right, through the normal multiplier effects that you have in banking to, gr to grow and develop large necessary infrastructure projects, water projects, you know, invest in high speed rail, all the things that uh, our government at the present time is balked on because they say, oh no, you can't build that, it's too expensive, where are we going to get the money from? Well, the money is there. Mm. It's just a matter of harnessing those deposits. We've talked about this a great deal in the last 32 years of our existence. It's just a matter of getting on and, and doing it and that's why it's so important that people get involved in our campaign to reinstate Christine Holgate because she has, uh, she is a sort of CEO that can actually provide the leadership necessary to transform the uh, postal system into an Australia Post bank. Yeah, that kind of problem-solving approach that she brought to Australia Post is critical because just what you were saying, you know, think about those kind of infrastructure projects we could fund. Yeah. Think about the jobs that would be created. I mean, what, how that would change the entire complexion of the economic crisis if you suddenly have hundreds of thousands of highly skilled engineering jobs, um, all kinds of, you know, jobs from top to bottom, you know, the support that would grow up around that for other industries and businesses, you know, it would just transform the face of the crisis that we're looking at. Well, there's no need for us then to shut down our petroleum refining capacity, say here in Alpine or in Victoria. We should never do that. That's a national security issue. All that sort of infrastructure should be nationalised. So we retain those higher paid jobs, you know, and you can, the government can provide or the, 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 the National Bank could provide the necessary credit for those sorts of operations. We shouldn't have just be reliant on the imported petroleum products. That, that's, mm. This is a disaster wanting to happen. Now, we're going to change the subject when we come back and talk about the ever simmering threat of war in the background here. Welcome back to the Citizens Report. We're now discussing 
China regime change fantasy means world war. And what we wanted to talk about today is a, a long article that was published at the end of January by the Atlantic Council, which is a quasi-official NATO lobby funded by the British Foreign Office. This was called the Longer Telegram Towards a New American China Strategy. And this draws on the, um, the so-called Long Telegram, which was a 1946 message from US diplomat George Kennan, who was stationed in Moscow, which is seen as heralding the commencement of the Cold War. The byline of that telegram was just marked with an X. This document today, which looks rather strange when you see it on the website, uh, is the byline is by anonymous. So it's pretty curious. Um, there's a lot of people in the US or some people have speculated as to who might have written this, one of which the suggest suggestions is Matt Post Pottinger, Matt Pottinger, who was in the um, Deputy National Security Advisor if, under the Trump administration. What this document states is that China has a US strategy, but the US has no China strategy. And so they're putting forward their suggestion. And I must say this has not been adopted by the Biden administration. That's yet to be seen. It specifies a number of red lines and they're the same old, same old things about Taiwan, the South China Sea and so forth. But what they point out, which is new, which we wanted to bring forward is a US strategy which focuses on the fault lines, as this says, to quote, among Xi and his inner circle aimed at changing their objectives and behaviour and thus their strategic course. And it goes on to say that the US can essentially engineer a coup against President Xi Jinping by leading circles of the Communist Party of China to return China to the pre-Xi Jinping era when China was fully engaged with the liberal international order. So they say that if Xi Jinping were out of the picture, China will rejoin the global order. Now, to us, this makes perfect sense because one of the things that happened when Xi Jinping came into power is he launched the Belt and Road Initiative, which was essentially a way of telling other countries, look, we lifted China out of poverty by using state-directed credit, having an industry policy, building infrastructure, we want to share that with the rest of the world because we can't get ahead if the rest of the world doesn't and we have no one to trade with and they could see the economic crisis. And it was also for that reason that China started to talk about uh, the requirements for a more efficient financial architecture. And they talked about it at the Hangzhou uh, G20 summit where they said we need to focus more on the real economy rather than just on the financialization that's been occurring. Now, as I said, the Biden administration has not signed on to this, which is important to know. And there was an article in September, October 2019, which made that clear by two key Biden advisors. This was in Foreign Affairs magazine, Jake Sullivan and Kirk Campbell, where they basically answered these, this question and said it's a folly for the US to try to overthrow the CCP. It would be better to live with each other as major powers in a steady state of coexistence. And China is so fully entwined with the global economy, uh, it would be hopeless to try to rule them out. It's the number one trade partner of two thirds of all countries. Lisa, we don't want war. The only way you're going to get away from that is to have sane politicians that realise that economic cooperation, actually Xi Jinping's win-win policy is a sane policy. He's bucking the entire global financial system and has done since you said uh, earlier, and that's what the issue is here. It's a different economic model towards actual so national sovereignty. Mm -hmm. So that's what we support. As it's an exactly the policy we've been enunciating mm -hmm. in regard to postal banking, state bank banking, infrastructure development. And there comes a time when there's a crisis. You put aside your differences, you work together to solve the problems and clean up the other problems along the way. Yeah. So we've run out of time for today. Thanks, Craig. Yeah, thanks, Lisa. Join us again next week. Mm -hmm.